can take it away. It's all yours. Great. Well, thanks, Brian, for the introduction and welcome everybody to this afternoon. As Brian mentioned, we've we've got um, some some great expert um, panelists here and some uh, some really interesting initiatives that are going on in the Northeast. So we look forward to hearing um, from Jen, Kate, and Julia today on on um, the initiatives they have going on. A couple in Vermont, and then and Julia's perspective uh, from the real estate side of things. Um, Remain, but applicable to the to the rest of our region as well too. So, just um, Brian provided a little bit of a background, but I just thought it'd be helpful for uh, in terms of introductions for each of you to just give a little context about about why you're here today and and what it is um, uh, what it is you're working on to make energy more visible in in your community. And why don't we start with Jen? Yeah, thank you, Richard. And uh, yes, thanks, Brian, for the introduction. And of course, Emmy for herding the cats. Here we all are. This is first sign of success. And I'm looking forward to um, you know, sharing the, the panel table with, with Kate and Julia. So yes, Richard, so I work for the Burlington Electric Department and my name is Jen Green and I am here because Burlington has essentially taken its existing minimum housing code, which has to be complied for if you own a rental building, and we have integrated weatherization into that code. So essentially, I'm going to be talking about um, how our rental policy has been expanded to include weatherization. And in that process, the phase out of time of sale and why we're phasing out time of sale and taking on what we think of as sort of a more robust approach to dealing with the split incentive. Did you want more? Right. Or you just wanted a re quick recap. Well, let's, let's do that. We'll, we'll certainly come back because we want to hear a little bit more about that. Thanks, Jen. Kate uh, Stevenson, you want to tell us a little bit about Montpelier? So um, I'm a volunteer on the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee, um, which is just a citywide um, volunteer group that, that helps the city with all kinds of energy initiatives from uh, looking at municipal energy use to education and outreach. And so one of our projects, I think, started four years ago was uh, looking at this idea of a time of sale ordinance, as Brian mentioned, um, for residential properties. Um, and so it requires um, folks to fill out this new Vermont home energy profile uh, when they list their house for sale um, and disclose the energy. Information. So we'll talk more about that, like what it took us to get us there. We passed the ordinance in May and we're in this one year um, pilot phase or, or uh, non-enforcement phase before, um, before it goes fully into effect with, with some penalties. So we can talk more about the details. Great, Thank, thanks Kate. Yeah, looking forward to that. Julia, I wanna tell us a little bit about why you're on the panel today and your perspective as a, as a realtor from Maine. I, I would, thank you very much. I am very delighted to be here with Kate and uh, Jen and with you, Richard, that um, uh, I think is uh, gonna be a wonderful opportunity. So I am a green broker. It's a designation from the National Association of Realtors. I've been a green broker for uh, over 10 years and uh, I've networked with providers of services and products for energy efficiency and renewable energy in um, the state and the region. Uh, I've been on the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships Helix Advisory Board since the beginning. So um, that's been a great opportunity for me. I participated with the Maine Energy Co Coalition. I was on the uh, Coalition for Green Capital in Maine when we started a, a Green Bank initiative um, that we are um, still working on. Um, I'm on the board of directors for the Greater Portland Board of Realtors, and I've just been appointed to the board of directors for the Maine Association of Realtors. And I am a founding member of the Sustainability Advisory Group for the Greater Portland Board of Realtors, which is the, um, it's the first uh, uh, group of realtors in, uh, in New England that has uh, formed a sustainability advisory group patterned after one that was formed at our um, national board level. Sounds like you're busy. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. Um, so why don't we go into a little more 
Yeah. Um, and we'll just we'll just keep going around here. If that if that works, Jen, tell us a little bit about about more about the Burlington Ordinance and what you think's working, what isn't. Um, I know it's it's relatively new, so um, so there may not may not be a lot of um, of performance data yet, but but share with us what what you've learned in getting here and and what you what you see working as 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 part of the uh, the ordinance. Yeah, sure, Richard. And maybe I'll just step back a few feet and just mention that we had a time of sale which went into effect in the late '90s. So essentially, when you sold a, a rental property, either the buyer or the seller had to upgrade it. And with the tight housing market, you know, we just weren't seeing a lot of turnover, approximately 50 buildings a year. And we figured if, you know, if we're going to make inroads here, we can't depend strictly on time of sale. Or we're, you know, we're going to be here for 150 years before we sort of everything turns over. So um, about two and a half years ago, the mayor, mayor, Mayor Moreau Weinberger, had a housing summit with a couple of key issues he wanted to tackle split incentive for rental properties being one of them. So this was an opportunity for us to sort of reanalyze the time of sale and think about what we could do better. So it came clear at that point that we should use, you know, what we already have in the toolbox, which is essentially this minimum housing code, which is enforced and overseen by the Department of Planning and Inspections. So you, as a rental property owner, your building is checked out essentially um, on a schedule one, three, five year increments. And under that um, ordinance, you essentially were reviewed as to whether, you know, um, your rental property was safe to live in. Were there smoke detectors, CO2 detectors, et cetera. So we had a process in place whereby we could, we could manage and look at rental properties and how they were doing from a livability standpoint. So we essentially decided to retire the time of sale and add this idea of weatherization to this existing ordinance, again, overseen by DPI or the Department of Planning and Inspections. This was passed in May. And what we've decided is we're gonna take the best of time of sale and we're gonna use that as our sort of trajectory. So essentially, if your building uses more than 50,000 BTUs per square foot, you're gonna to have to drop that load. We've decided that we're gonna be looking uh, at the most egregious energy users at this point. So the ordinance is now focused on those that use 90,000 and above. Those buildings are gonna have to get into compliance or at least show good faith that they're on the road to compliance by January 1, 2022. So letters have been sent out from DPI to all the rental property owners with an FYI, this is live now, we'll be back in touch with you um, in the very near term to confirm that your building is one of these 90 and above. Um, so please be prepared. What we're finding is that property owners are quickly sort of calling our partners at BGS and saying, where are we on the BTU scale? Do we need to get going or not? So there's a lot of traffic um, at BGS, which we take as a good sign. So I don't wanna to take too much time now, we can get into specifics later, but that's sort of where we are. Um, 90,000 and above, you're gonna to have to come into compliance by January 1, 2022, at which point the time of sale will sort of go away. Um, we're working now with Vermont Gas on um, deciphering the data so that we can come up with tranches between the 50 and the 90,000 mark. Um, and we'll be, really, um, who's, in each of those tranches will be made clear to us soon. We, we don't know yet, we're still working on that data. But again, what we do know is in the short term, it's the 90,000 and above with the understanding that we're gonna be sort of ratcheting that down to 50 and above um, over the next uh, short year, years. Just, just for, uh, that's really helpful, Jen. Just for clarification, off, off, you know, if you don't, it sounds like you may not have the data um, present, you're working on it. How many of the rental properties in Burlington do you think are above that 90,000? 90, 90, is that like 10% or is it 50%? Yeah, good question. We don't know. There are a couple of bets over beers over where the numbers will fall. Um, we don't think it's as large a percentage as people may think. So I, I, I would say probably not 50%. Um, so stay tuned and we'll get that to you soon. 
Thanks. Kate, you want to dive in a little deeper on the Montpelier ordinance? Just give us a little, little more detail on, on what the elements are of that and, and where that came from. Sure. So when we started this um, path towards our ordinance, we were really looking at um, you know, how can we incentivize energy efficiency improvements? And, and going back to kind of the core reason was we, we have seen data that show that folks with that when they purchase a, a property, that's like one of the moments in the lifespan of the building when they're more likely to be making investments and, and improvements to the home. So um, we were like, okay, here's one point where we where we potentially have a, a, a place to have some leverage in in the, the lifespan of the house. Um, and so we we're really looking at this idea of not just time of sale, but time of listing. So how do we inform potential buyers who are you know, looking at all the houses on the market. Um, what's the energy use of these homes? How can they compare them? How do we get this idea of the apples to apples comparison? Because you know, these houses are in Montpelier often very old um, and squeaky. And you know, one house might have an 80-year-old little little old lady who keeps her, her thermostat at 85 degrees, and another house might have a family of seven people living in it. Um, and, you know, how do we compare apples to apples? Um, and, and just getting the existing fuel and electricity data, like, doesn't necessarily help with that. So, um, so we went down this path of wanting to um, have a tool, the Vermont, what, what is now called the Vermont Home Energy Profile, you know, which was developed with this help. Um, by me, <laughs> um, to where, folk, where we can kind of input um, basic information that kind of automatically flows in about the age of the house, the square footage of the house, the location of the house, um, and then allows a seller to input additional data if they want to. And the idea really was how do we do this at low or no cost? Because we looked at other ordinances, you know, Portland, Oregon, for an example, um, other cities where they were doing this, but requiring a full-on energy audit, which you know costs hundreds of dollars and requires, you know, can cause a delay in the sale process. So we were like, okay, what can be actually relatively easy, um, low cost, and um, doable for the seller? So we've really been over the last two years, um, maybe more than that, looking at this tool, the VF tool, Home Energy Profile tool. Um, beta testing it, <laughs> um, doing lots of, you know, trying to run lots of scenarios um, to make sure that it worked the way that it needed to work. Um, you know, some of the things we learned were like, you know, we have a lot of houses with wood heat, you know, how do we accommodate for, for wood heating? Um, how do we allow people to enter information about their um, solar array and their, their renewable energy production? So, um, you know, we with a lot of feedback and, and kind of testing and um, finally have the tool in a place where we feel like it's useful, it's accurate. And, um, and then with the passing of the ordinance in May, we're now putting it out there and just saying, when you initially list your house, you need to have filled out this profile. It's basically a two page PDF that attached to the real estate listing. Um, and if you're showing your house, you know you need to have, you need to supply copies of this to everyone that's that's coming through. Um, and we're just the idea is really inform the buyer so they have as much information as possible um, in the in the purchase process. Um, and that it also incentivizes you know that theoretically folks that have made investments in weatherization and solar and things like that um, will see that additional value represented in the the sale price of their home because it's, it's more visible and it's more recognized. So that's where we are. We're in the, the kind of initial first six months of kind of rolling it out, making sure that everyone knows that this now exists, that they're supposed to be doing it when they list their house. Um, you know, Jen mentioned that one of the challenges of their previous time of sale ordinance was just the lack of turnover. And I think that is something that we are concerned about there are only about a hundred home sales on average every year in the city of Montpelier. You know, we're a small town of seven thousand people. So um, 
you know, we can get into more of the critiques, but that is one issue is that we um, we know it's only gonna, if we have 4,000 households in the city and we hit a hundred of them every year, you know, it's only a fraction and, and would take a long time. And it does not apply to commercial um, or industrial properties. So it's basically anything residential up to four units. And, and so just clarify, it's it's been in effect for six months, but it's just a voluntary uh, process now. When, when, when uh, will it be enforced as a requirement? Starting July 1st of next year. So okay. they, they gave it a year of uh, no penalties, but there will be penalties um, starting next July. And honestly, we are still kind of figuring out the enforcement piece of it and who from the city is going to be enforcing it um, and even how how can we test who is in compliance or not. Um, so these are some of the details that like I say, we're still working out. Great. Well, that's that's helpful. Um, we'll, we'll dig into it a little more here as well. Julia, do you want to tell us from um, how you're working to make energy visible and and your sales and and buying process for your customers? Well, you, you know, uh, in our disclosures, like the disclosures in in uh, Vermont, the seller is supposed to is supposed to say how much energy the home is using. Um, that doesn't always happen. Um, Realtors are supposed to try to fill in the blanks if the seller is not present or able to speak for um, the energy consumption. If the house is rented, they're supposed to ask the renter how much energy is being used. Um, if they're using heat pumps, of course, then the electrical energy gets mixed in with the general operating uh, electricity of the household. So there's really no way except um, a theoretical way to, to tease that out. So, you know, that's that's all uh, that's all uh, kind of kind of the the, the problems. Um, and we are uh, we are working mainly on education. Our um, our sustainability advisory group is trying to educate realtors on um, what's you know what's really important to their client when you when you when you look at a realtor a realtor you know it's not a philanthropic kind of organization it's a trade association and realtors are are um are, are pretty numerous and it's a pretty powerful trade association looking out for the interests of realtors well realtors are supposed to be looking out for the interests of their clients so um they don't they don't tend to like time of sale um ordinances because that that burdens the transaction, um, and they don't they don't like um, requiring energy audits because that could could disadvantage a house that didn't perform as well as another house. So so there's you know there's 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 various issues that you guys have already uh, had to deal with uh, with your your realtor association in in doing that. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to shift the conversation over to what's good for the consumer because that's our fiduciary responsibility is to look out for the interests of the consumer. And if the consumer is saving money, if the consumer is um, has a healthier indoor air quality, if the, if the consumer has a, a, um, a higher resale value because the property can be demonstrated with an energy audit or an energy profile to have uh, had uh, some weatherization work done on it to make it uh, uh, use less operating income. In other words, you know they've invested in the building, which 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 um, uh, increases in value over time, as opposed to sending money to the utility, which doesn't get them anything. And and so when they've made that shift into investing their their um, monthly income into a better building, even if they had to borrow money to do it, then. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to educate the realtors to say that's a good thing. That that's a good thing for all of us, and 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 you should you know get out of that that habit of being against this stuff as a kind of knee jerk reaction and get behind it because it's it's good for uh, everybody that's involved. So, so um, 
it's it's refreshing to hear a realtor through with with that perspective. So thank you for for the good work that you're doing. Is 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 that going to be different whether you're a buyer's agent or working for the seller? It seems like there are different interests at play here. Can you can you just speak to that a little bit? Um, is, is am I am I reading it right? You know, buyer versus seller and and the role that realtors would play in in representing one party or the other. Um, that's a that's a good question. I I think that that a buyer agent is is uh, uh, Probably uh, looking to 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 get more disclosure because that's you know that's in their buyer's best interest, but I think it's in the seller's best interest as well. So uh, I I have to think about that, Richard. I haven't I haven't really uh, uh, thought about that question, but um, maybe Kate has some experience with that in her interactions. If there's a a, a difference, I don't know. Okay. Um, sorry, I was, that, that wasn't one of our, our, our preconceived questions. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it just oh. it seemed it just it just seems like there might be a, a, a different perspective depending on who you're working. I, with. I think the, the key is is to to keep it on the um, keep it on the, the 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 plane of what's good for the consumer because uh, we we can't we can't deny that that is. Our objectives as well um, to to help our consumer. I think, you know, we could also on a, a larger scale say that climate change really hurts properties. I mean, you know, fires and floods and sea level rise. I'm on I'm on a coastal community. I have worked 16 coastal communities up and down the southern coast of Maine. Sea level rise scares the bejesus out of me. I have to say, and and it doesn't seem to get on the radar of of our. Uh, uh, our uh, um, people uh, on the inland um, part of the of, of the state, but it, it really is something that that concerns me, and it and should concern um, all of us. It, it, and Vermont had a hair uh, a hair raising experience with a hurricane uh, just a couple of years ago that did tremendous damage. And being a state that's two uh, two states in from the coast, I mean, I don't think anybody saw that coming. So re resilience of properties. Um, and uh, that sort of thing should be of, of primary interest to realtors. But I think it's going to take a long time just because of the, the politics of, of climate change. Unfortunately, it's become so polarized. It's going to take a long time to, to sell that. Um, I think it's a lot more likely just to keep it on the cost benefits. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's why we're doing this work is to try to advance, ad advance that um, the, the response to that um, that threat. Um, Jen, can you tell us a little bit about what maybe what challenges you've seen and and some of the some of the um, responses you've you've heard from consumers or, or or maybe it's really the the property owners in in Burlington with your ordinance. A um, little little bit of perspective there. Sure, and if you don't mind, Richard, just some quick background that I failed to mention. You know, VGS, which is also an energy efficiency utility, Vermont Gas Systems, offers up to 75% of the cost to weatherize a rental building. So there are incentives out there for, for property owners. The problem, of course, and many of them have taken advantage. It's surprising, though, how many have not, despite this money on the table. So um, I think it's important that we've got this ordinance in play because it's gonna drive people to take advantage of those incentives. You ask about challenges though. So there's, you know, there's gonna be a, a rush for the incentives, a rush to get work done. And as I know we're all facing or all aware of is that um, there aren't enough contractors um, to do the work expediently. So I would argue that's probably one of our, our biggest challenges or what we anticipate to be one of the biggest challenges. This isn't going to happen quickly, just given the, the backlog of work. I mean, we understand now that a, a rental property that wants to have work done is possibly waiting as late as next fall before it's possible to, um, to actually have any physical work done. So that's, that's probably um, the biggest thing. Um, I might also, whoops, I think you're, uh, Sorry. you're muted there, yeah. Richard. There you go. Do, do you foresee um, uh, any adjustments to your your time frame there? I, I, I guess um, you know it, it, the workforce is a 
workforce challenge is a, is a big is a big one. Um, uh, and if you've got um, property owners who are making a good faith effort, um, it, it sounds like you've got a little bit of flexibility built into the to the system. Yeah, correct. And this is why we're saying that if your building uses more than, than 90,000 BTUs or above, you've got to show us that you've started the process going in terms of identifying your contractor and getting work done by January 1. So the original hope was that this first tranche would be in compliance by that date. We see that's just not possible. We really don't want to yeah, end up with this um, tremendous sort of backlog, a lot of frustration, a lot of anger. So show us that by January 1, you started the ball rolling, you've identified a contractor, or at least been in communication. Um, so yeah, we've had to have some flexibility on that end. Yeah. Uh, Kate, do you want to do, is it early enough uh, or is it too early in the process to, to share some, some challenges that, that you have either seen or foresee? Um, what, what do you think um, some of those challenges might be? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the challenges just in, in developing the ordinance and getting it passed and in all the community forums and, and um, hearings that we had for it. I mean, one of them I've mentioned already is just that it's only going to affect a small number of buildings every year. Um, and right now we're in such a hot real estate market that things are listed and they're sold in 24 hours. And, you know, the chance of us even like, no. <laughs> You know, being able to um, have any influence or like remind people that you're supposed to have this community profile in that short period is, is unlikely. Um, so, you know, just things are moving fast. People are buying houses sight unseen. So there's kind of this craziness of the real estate market. Um, there are, you know, we heard a lot of concerns about equity and how this would affect low income um, sellers in particular and, and uh, older folks. You know, there's a concern that that folks who don't have access to a computer or the internet, how are they going to be able to fill out the profile? Um, you know, and, and what we heard from a lot of realtors was, you know, concern that this was getting foisted on the realtors and it was then their liability. Uh, we really are trying to make it more focused on the seller themselves that they have to um, fill out this information. But um, but yeah, so we're trying to figure out what are strategies that that um, you know, ways that we can help um, seniors or other folks who might not have access to internet to be able to comply with this ordinance. Um, you know, and then, and I think the other equity question was just that, is this gonna disadvantage sellers who haven't had the, the resources to invest in weatherization or do upgrades to their buildings? And is their real resale value going to drop as a result of the ordinance? Because they're then being compared against buildings that have had improvements. Um, you know, I think it's it's certainly a concern, but we also really wanted to look at it from the flip side of that, which is the buyer, the low income buyer. Um, and how many times we've heard stories about folks who bought their first home and then were like shocked by getting $800 oil bills that they had no idea were coming. Um, so we do feel like there are a lot of benefits to the buy to um, low-income buyers and having more information when they go into the buying process so they can really um, compare these buildings against each other. So, so, so what, given that, what, what, what might that look like if there is a house that, 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 um, that uh, rated poorly or, or showed that the expected uh, annual energy costs were going to be high, uh, as part of the time of listing process, what what would a potential buyer do with that information? What, what's the expectation? Yeah, um, I mean, part of the profile does have kind of some somewhat boilerplate information on the backside that, that points people to the resources that are available in terms of efficiency in Vermont, different incentives, different um, loan programs for buyers where they might be able to wrap in um, an efficiency upgrade into their mortgage, you know, at a lower interest rate. So we're trying to point them towards some of those resources um, at the same time and feel like this is this is a moment where you can get in front of them. But yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's, it seems like that's the the ultimate outcome is to get them to that next step and to take 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 those steps, take advantage of those programs. So that's that's great. 
Um, Julia, given, given the realtor's interest in all of these, these buying and, and selling issues, um, wh what do you, um, what do you think are, um, how, how do we, how do we work with the real estate community and realtors to, to make energy more visible? Um, what, what can they do besides, you know, you mentioned some of the disclosures that are already available. Is there anything, and, and, and education, um, is, is there more than that? Is that the primary approach to take in, in bringing realtors along to, to, um, bring forward what has historically been sort of invisible and hidden in the transaction? How, how do we, how do we make energy performance more visible in the sales process? Well, that's, that's, where, that's where labeling comes in. Energy efficiency is, is um, intrinsically invisible. It has no curb appeal. It has, uh, you know, the appraiser uh, walked through my house, with, which had a tremendous amount of uh, energy efficiency. I even gave him a typed list of all the energy efficiency things that we had done. And he, and he still, you know, didn't, didn't put it in the, uh, in the uh, appraisal per se. Um, so it's, it's, it's really incumbent upon us to, to shine a light. We have to have a paper certificate of some kind that says we invested in this building in such and such a way and the outcome is such and such a, a result. Like I said before, transferring our money from, from, the, you know, from the operating expenses to the, to the um, equity. And, and um, so that's one, one of the reasons I work on labeling a lot. And, and um, I really support uh, what, uh, you know, what, what Vermont has done with uh, trying to label. And I think it's probably coming to Maine. I've heard it maybe coming to Maine really soon. Um, so um, uh, education is, is for us just to say, okay, you know, this is happening. Um, it's a good thing, and and how can we help you embrace it as a as a professional to to um, to agree that it's, it's a good thing. So I put some things into the chat, um, uh, some resources that, that I refer to a lot. Um, one of them is a National Association of Realtors. Um, they do an annual or biannual uh, uh, study on uh, the sustainability uh, sustainability survey. So they ask realtors what's going on and and a couple of things I, I just uh, uh, wanted to highlight. So uh, in this last study, 65% of realtors said that promoting energy efficiency in listings is valuable. Great. However, only 22% had participated in the sale of a property that had green features. So that shows that you know we're, we're still we're all coming up into this this practice. Some of us have, have seen it coming. So, you know, we're a little bit more prepared than others, but the general realtor is not seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis. And then 55% um, uh, said their clients were interested in sustainability. So, you know, that, that says that, you know, okay, they, they realize that there's, there's something going on there that their clients, their clients want. But as I think Kate, Kate or Jen, I can't remember which one, I think it was Kate mentioned it, Homes are flying off the shelves now. We've got, uh, according to uh, Fannie Mae, uh, we we have a three uh, and a half million dollar uh, million unit deficit of housing in the United States right now. So, so supply is not keeping up with demand. There's nothing that we can do about it in a very immediate uh, sense because, as as uh, I think Jen said, we don't have the workforce to build more houses right now. So there's some systemic issues um, to, to solving that, that housing crisis. So as it is, buyers can't be real picky, you know, when it comes to, I want you know, a house that has these green features. Well, guess what? You, you don't uh, get to choose. You're just going to have to find whatever you can do. What we want to do is if they choose to do something more with their house, like weatherize it, um, down down the road with incentives like we have efficiency Maine. You guys have efficiency Vermont. We wish we had efficiency Vermont, but we're pretty happy with efficiency Maine. Sorry, efficiency Maine. Uh, but but uh, you guys have have done a tremendous amount of of uh, work with with incentives and um, and we're doing a lot too. I'm just kidding. Uh, and and so you know we hope that we can 
get people to to do things after the the point of sale. I um, you know might might take issue with the comment that that people invest the most in their house at the time of sale. I, I don't agree with that. I, I think the time of sale is a time of, of uh, uh, a, a lot of stress financially, even for a well um, healed uh, buyer. Um, there's right now running a closing costs of about eight thousand dollars per transaction, and you know having to throw money at multiple offer situations. It's very very stressful. So I don't I don't think that people then turn around and go, hey, you know. You know, what's a couple uh, energy projects we can jump into at this house? You know, they're, they're going to take a few years to, you know, get their, get their heart rate down and, and uh, uh, work into that. But um, uh, another thing that I put up in the chat is a, is a study that I uh, refer to a lot. It's the, um, it's the main baseline uh, study of, um, uh, uh, What's, oh, what's the darn name of it? Um, the baseline uh, single family home study. So what they did was they went out and measured a bunch of homes, which in New England, all of us share in New England that we have old leaky homes. That's just what we have. And so our homes on the average uh, have 11 air changes an hour. Maine's have, have like nine. Connecticut's have around 10. So, you know, we all have old leaky houses. So. The good news is there's an 80-20 rule that I, I think uh, I've I've discovered goes into play that it, you can you can uh, if you look at that baseline report you can figure it out real easily. Um, there's we can put insulation in the attics. We can insulate the foundations. We can um, air seal um, all of the uh, penetrations and all the windows and that, and that kind of thing without without having to do anything invasive into the building. You know, we don't have to tear it down to the studs and, and you know, re redo everything. So, so if we just do those things, we can capture 80% of the efficiency benefits. And, and those things are, they're not, that, they're not that hard or expensive to do and we can get most of the value. So I think that it's important to keep it in perspective. The house doesn't have to be, you know, a, a, uh, passive house uh, standard. It could be uh, a, a good enough, uh, you know, even a five ACH 50 house is a much better shape house than 11. So. Great. Yes. A lot of opportunities. And thanks for putting those in the chat. I see also that um, folks from NEAT put in there uh, links to the ordinances in Burlington and Montpelier as well, too, if, if people want to um, want to um, pull those down and, and take a look at that. And and speak, speaking of which, um, Jen, you want to tell us a little bit about the process for getting there? I mean, I, I uh, it's generally not easy to pass an ordinance, especially one that that imposes new requirements on on um, a sector of the population that's probably got some political clout in in Burlington. So how did you? How'd you go about um, moving this through and, and getting it passed? Just, you know, in light of other communities who may be interested in, in e either or both of these approaches. Well, I guess two things. A, we have a very progressive, fast-moving, eager city council who really wanted to make this happen. So there was a lot of political will on the one hand. We were also concerned, though, that it would be so cost prohibitive um, to bring these buildings into compliance. The last thing we wanted to do was have that sort of mom or pop uh, um, property owner, i.e. those that own a building or two, it's sort of their livelihood, have to sell because they found that it was so prohibitive to do all the work that was required. So there is a cost cap. Um, you'll notice in the ordinance, if you get a chance to, to open it up and scroll through the, the pros, that there's a $2,500 cost cap on each unit. So what we're essentially saying is, this is what you're aiming for. We're, we're aiming for 50,000 BTUs or less, but we're also saying that first time around, you don't necessarily need to spend more than $2,500 per, per unit. So we think those guardrails are helpful because it gives a property owner something to sort of aim for. We also think that's a fair and legitimate number which can actually make inroads on the BTUs of a property. Um, I hope that answers your question, at least in one way. Yeah, no, that's that's great. That's really helpful. 
Kate, can you can you provide us a little bit as well too? And I'm ho hoping you'll mention your mayor in the process in terms of how you how you got to where you are. Right. So we have a mayor who's a longtime member of the energy committee um, and, a, and a big proponent of, of these energy ordinances. So it was really, I think, the idea started with her and, um, and kind of worked its way through the, the energy committee over, over the years. But yeah, I think um, in terms of actually writing the ordinance, I don't know, it takes many iterations, um, review with the city's lawyers, um, kind of shopping it around and, and really to trying to understand how we're going to enforce it, but also not being so specific that then it gets outdated really easily. So, you know, we don't want to say that so-and-so in this department is responsible for um, the enforcement because, you know, they may five years from now reorganize the departments or have had different people in charge of different things. So we want to kind of, we wanted to leave it flexible enough um, but now it's very flexible and we actually have to figure out just um, what else with the, with the ordinance itself. We had, we had a series of public forums um, just open to anyone in the community. We had a, a series of forums specifically targeted to the real estate professionals um, because we were getting a lot of feedback from them. Um, and then we had to go through a process of three public hearings um, in front of city council. Uh, I think you were there for some of it, Richard. We had um, quite a lot of discussion. I think in each of those hearings, we had over two hours of public comment. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the just um, as Kate mentioned, I, I was part of the process initially, and I just I had no realization what it took in Vermont to, to change um, an, an ordinance in a, in a municipality. It's, it takes an act, of, an act of the legislature and multiple actions by city council and public vote. And it really, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a significant hurdle to, to get to the point where you change your ordinance language uh, and enable you to do this. So, that was a learning experience for me. I had no idea what what her hoops you had to jump through in order to to do that. I forgot I about believe that in whole first part with the legislature. So we had to, you know, basically to change um, to make an ordinance like this, we had to change the city charter to yep. give the city the um, authority to regulate energy efficiency in buildings. Um, and so we brought that charter change to the state legislature. Um, and it took a long time for them to even take it up. And then they basically kind of, I don't even remember the exact language, but they pushed it back and were like, no, you can't have all that authority, but we'll just give you this small amount of authority only on residential buildings, um, only at time of sale. And so we're like, okay, uh, we'll, we'll take that. But that took two years just to go to Atlanta to a public vote, uh, you know, um, statewide vote on the ballot said like we're going to request this charter change and it had to go to the legislature and sit in committee where nothing happened for many many months and then finally we got back you know a, a fraction of what we asked for in terms of authority um, and then we could actually go forward into the process of drafting an ordinance um, you know and that really was kind of in parallel with the development of the, the home energy profile tool that need have been working on and so kind of um, understanding like what the constraints are of that tool. And that is one reason, just want to say like one reason why we are focused on residential buildings with four units or less is because that's kind of what the tool is designed to be able to model. It's basically a, a very simple but yet complex energy model um, that, that can both like pull rank, uh, publicly available data, but also um, seller can put in additional data if they choose to things like yes i have an energy star refrigerator or yes i have solar or um you know they can input lots of different things about their so, so having that statewide having that statewide home energy profile tool available seemed like it enabled montpelier to to then sort of latch onto it and use it for your ordinance right otherwise yeah i don't think would have been able to move forward or we would have been stuck looking at this you know 
the Portland, Oregon model of the energy audit. I, I think can I just jump in? Yeah. Can I just jump in here? I, yeah. I think that that's really important because uh, as in addition to having not enough uh, workforce to do the energy uh, weatherization work, we don't have enough energy auditors. And and like in Maine, we have like three or four of them. So uh, I, I think it's really cool that that this particular kind of profile and I for, for years was a staunch proponent of a HERS index. And I finally have had to, to back off of that because I, I just don't have a way to get it done. But this is doable. This takes, this takes AI basically of, of uh, gathering a bunch of data from public uh, data sets and, and um, make some assumptions, but then the homeowner can come in and say, you know, uh, uh, well, this is, this is how it, it really is. And and that's really important because we, you know, we get a lot of, of um, flack in the real estate community with with certain AI uh, functions like like Zillow and other companies. They'll say, "Oh, your home is worth X," which it doesn't apply in New England because there's there's just there's no tract housing here, so you can't say that just because your neighbor's house is worth a half a million dollars that your house must be too. That just doesn't work here and um, probably doesn't work anywhere in New England. So I, I just think that this is a, a really great balance of what, what could work and, and what could have some real difference. Richard, I'd like to make a plug for Neve too, just even beyond the tool, like having a, a body that can serve as a sounding board. So I do remember at least one occasion when we sat around with, with, with you know, sort of the neat powers that be and just talked about the language and how it might play out. and sort of having a body like that um, is really fundamental. So you're not completely going it alone. Well, I, I'll, I'll give Neep a plug as well too, because I, I want to credit Neep with, um, with actually providing Mayor Watson and Watson from Montpelier. We, we, we took her captive and drove her down to a Neep labeling meeting for a day in Massachusetts. And, um, and she got religion and, and came back and sort of ran with it. So. Um, so I, I think, yeah, having, having a, a collective discussion and, and people who are working on this is really important. Um, so that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Julie, I'm, I'm wondering whether you see any potential in, in other communities um, for e either or both of these types of, of uh, ordinances that, you know, for the rental property focus uh, and or time of listing you know, using the tools like the home energy profile. Well, I would like I would like to uh, echo what what Jen said that there's just not enough uh, transactions to to get meaningful change done on 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 those kind of numbers in time. I mean, we we have we have very little time to to get some of these buildings uh, weatherized, and we've got in, in Maine we've got a half a million of them, so we've got a lot. Of work ahead of us, and everyone is a snowflake, and everyone is an adventure, and um, you know it's it's we gotta we gotta get going. So I I applaud um, uh, uh, both of these efforts. Um, I I think that uh, I think that it's going to come to Maine, and I and I think that uh, 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 those of us in the sustainability advisory group will will do our best to to support it. It'll probably come to the greater Portland area first, just because of the population density that we have here and kind of how it swings, but um, we'll, uh, 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 we'll, we'll do our utmost to, to pave the way uh, that, uh, that we have uh, in front of us. I, um, I, I think that it's gonna be uh, very important to get the volume up though. And I think that that's uh, one of the things I work on is financing. I think that if more financing were available to, to uh, homeowners, uh, even even for those of them who could do it themselves, if they had, you know, more financing available, um, that would be that would be a key. And I think that getting that energy mortgage going in Vermont was 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 huge. Um, I'd like to learn more about that because we don't have any we don't have any lenders that I know of in the state who are giving a homeowner a break on uh, having lower operating costs or giving a buyer a break on that. Well, let's talk about it after this because that was a pilot that we ran so um, with our credit union. So um, shout out to VSCCU, Vermont State Employees Credit Union, which really is a leader in this in, in Vermont. 
Um, so so um, we, we've got five minutes left. I, I would quickly go around and just um, maybe share what you see the future of, of your, uh, uh, what's on the horizon for your initiatives and start with Ben, what do you, what do you see coming up and where are we going with, with Burlington's efforts? Yeah, I, and I do just want to quickly, you know, mention that this was sort of precipitated by Mayor Weinberger's interest in, in addressing the split incentive. I don't think I made that really clear. And, you know, we've been trying to figure this out for a long time. So I give um, Mayor Weinberger's administration a lot of credit for thinking creatively about how we could make this happen. I talked about our city council, of course, which is sort of one entity who's sort of driving it from behind and eager to have things move quickly. But had it not been for the mayor's um, commitment to this split incentive challenge, we wouldn't be here. So just where are we going? We're just really eager to get that data um, from, from VGS and to begin to establish our tranches. Um, it's a big communications lift to ensure that all the property owners in the city know that this is online, live and happening, and they've got a, a time frame under which we have to operate. But sort of confident that within the next three years, we can get everybody in line and, um, we're going to make inroads on our transition to net zero energy and a reduction in fossil fuels. 95% of the city, of course, is natural gas saturated. So sort of eager to, to make progress on net zero energy through weatherization. Um, well, I, so I think we maybe have heard what's ahead. I'm seeing there are a couple questions here. So maybe, um, Kate, unless you had something you wanted to add beyond what, what you what you've said um, in terms of what's what, what you see going forward. Is there anything more or should we jump to the questions? Well, the questions are fine. And I think it actually, the one that I saw relates to what's going forward. You know, for us, it's really, I think the next eight months, we're trying to get the word out about this new ordinance. But um, in addition to the single family homes, um, we, you know, to, to address what Burlington's been doing too, we do want to start um, or continue our work with the rental um, rental properties. So we have about 50-50 in terms of the split between um, owner-occupied and rented units in Montpelier. And uh, two years ago, right before COVID, we did a pilot project where we did um, kind of a concierge service, like targeted outreach to each uh, multifamily property owner and really trying to help connect them with the resources and the incentives and the financing and you know made a really great effort at that over about a six to eight month period uh, with some help from staff at Vermont. And so um, I'm hoping that we can come back around to that um, and continue that and, and keep working down the list of the 400 multifamily property owners. Um, so we don't have the same kind of um, rental uh, enforcement or we, um, we don't have any inspection in the city of Montpelier for rental units. So we don't, we can't necessarily copy what Burlington's doing, but it is, um, it's really important for us to think about how we're going to address all of those rental units as well. So I think that's the next big lift. And, and Jen, there's a there's a question to you about whether property owners have been given information about what resources are available to them, the weatherization assistance program, efficiency Vermont, others. How, how does that connection made in in Burlington? Yeah, the, people are getting information on um, yeah those resources as well as course of Vermont Gas's weatherization incentive. So that's really the big one. Needless to say. Great. Um, so, Julia, you want to um, have have any final words of wisdom in our last last minute? <laughs> oh, sure. Um, <clears throat> so, we don't have very much natural gas in in Maine. We've got a lot of ledge and a big rural population. So, natural gas pretty much comes up the I ninety five corridor and then has some little teeny. Uh, 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 places that they, they go out to for various reasons. So most of our, most of our um, uh, uh, heating is done with heating oil, number two heating oil. Two thirds of our homes are, are still heated with heating oil and, and that's not good. It's, it's not as efficient as gas and it's a lot dirtier. So what we're trying to do is weatherization, electrification and solarization and uh, in that order. So tighten up the house, move it onto heat pumps 
and try and get solar on the roof or community solar. We're, we're just starting our, our solar adventure here in, in, in Maine. But um, I think that, that that's the model that, that we're trying to promote and um, that's what we're all working towards. Great, Thank, thanks so much. Thanks to all the panelists, Brian and Emmy probably have some final words here, but um, that was really insightful and really appreciate your, your perspective. So thank you for your time today. Yes, thank you everyone. That was, that was a fantastic discussion and I won't take up too much time since we're at the top of the hour, but um, uh, yeah, again, thank you all. That was um, great. I just want to do another plug for our next, um, the third webinar in this series um, on December 7th at 1 to 2 p.m. Innovative partnerships for collaborating for community discussion. So come learn how we can take these complex issues and solve them with collaborative um, uh, networks. So with that, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. And thank you again to all the panelists and our moderator. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.